So for today's episode, I'm going to try to explain to you or simplify intra-aortic balloon pumps. So in my nursing career, when I graduated nursing school back in 2016, I first started off on a cardiac step down. It was a half step down, half ICU. So half of the unit was a cardiac ICU. The other half was a cardiac step down. So I worked on this cardiac step down for, I want to say about six to eight months. And then I moved my way to the, the cardiac ICU. It's actually a cardiovascular thoracic unit. Um, not, I want to say a specifically a, a cardiac ICU because we do a lot of pul- pulmonology stuff. We do a lot of renal stuff, but it's mainly focused on, on cardiology. And we work with two major things in this unit. It's intraortic glum pumps and also swan gans catheters, also known as pulmonary artery catheters. And when I first started working there, and I first experienced my intra-area balloon pump class or my first intra-area balloon pump patient, it really blew my mind how we can create these machines, how we take a balloon, shove it up someone's groin, and we have it sit in the aortic artery, and it literally helps the patient perfuse and helps their heart out, helps them with heart failure, and it, it's basically able to sustain their life until they either recover or they get a heart transplant, or they get an LVAD. So these machines right here, intra blue pumps, really blew my mind and really got me curious into, into, into cardiology, into cardiac, into cardiac ICU, and into the mechanisms of how we treat heart failure or how we help decompensating patients with these, these crazy machines. So intra aortic blue pump. So what is an intra aortic blue pump? So essentially, an intra aortic blue pump is an intravascular volume displacement device. So what it does is basically it displaces the blood in the aorta and at the same time it is able to reduce the workload of the ventricles and increase ejection fraction during systolic. So what really confused me a lot of times was the word augmentation. I never really understood what it mean. We're augmenting diastolic pressure. What does that mean? So what the, by definition, what augmentation means or to augment is just to make greater because you might hear that we're augmenting the diastolic pressure. You might hear augmentation. What that means is we're just making that diastolic pressure greater or bigger so it could help push blood into the coronary artery. So it could help better perfuse the myocardium. So when you hear of augmented diastolic pressure, it means the diastolic pressure is being helped. It's being, it's being helped to make it a little bit greater. So pressure increases and it's able to help perfuse those coronaries during the phase of diastole. So what are some indications for an intraaortic balloon pump? Acute MI, cardiogenic shock. You can have acute mitral valve regurge. You could also have a ventral septal defect going on. For cardiac surgery, cardiac catheterizations, as well as any kind of cardiac surgeries or angioplasties, ventricular arrhythmias, unstable anginas, and also refractory ventricular failure. So a lot of our heart failure patients are going to get this balloon pump. A lot of patients that are undergoing cardiac surgery will get this as well, just to help support the, the cardiac function while they're going through this very, very rough phase for the heart. Cardiac surgery does a lot of, puts a lot of stress on the heart. So we want to minimize that stress as much as we can. So we like to put them on a intra aortic balloon pump to help their heart work a little bit less while still perfusing the body and still increasing the cardiac output. So what are some of the hemodynamic effects? I want to go through how it affects four things of the heart, but we're going to simplify it down because you don't really technically need to know all this. It's good knowledge, but when it comes to your basic bedside care or how to troubleshoot or how to figure out what the intra aortic balloon pump does. All you need to really know is these three things, but let me go to, to each part of the heart and how it affects it. So basically, the intra aortic balloon pump improves the failing heart by increasing myocardial oxygen supply and at the same time decreasing the myocardial oxygen demand. So in the aorta, it decreases systolic pressures and increases the diastolic pressures depending on inflation and deflation. In the left ventricle, it decreases systolic pressures, decreases end diastolic pressures, decreases volume, 
and decreases wall tension. So you can see how if somebody has left ventricular failure, this intra aortic boom pump helps to ease that stress and that tension on the heart by not only affecting the pressures, but also helping with the, with the wall tension. In the heart, it decreases afterload, decreases preload, and also increases cardiac output. And blood flow, it increases coronary blood flow and coronary perfusion, as well as systemic perfusion. So how does the intra-aortic balloon pump work? So it works by inflating a balloon and deflating that balloon, depending on what cardiac cycle we are in, what part of the cardiac cycle we are in. So when the aortic valve is closed, we are in diastole. So when the aortic valve is closed, the balloon pump is inflated. Inflation occurs during diastole and deflation occurs in systole when the aortic valve is opened. So with the timing of the intra-aortic balloon pump, it is set to inflate when the aortic valve closes, also at the diquatic notch. And it's set to deflate immediately as the aortic valve opens. Why this happens? Because Imagine if this balloon was going to inflate when your aortic valve is open. Your heart is pushing blood through the aortic valve into your, your, your system, right? So if the balloon was inflated during this, the heart would be pumping blood against the balloon. This would increase pressure. This would, litter, this would cause a really high pressure at the tip of the balloon pump and you could literally rupture your, your aorta. You could cause further heart failure. You can cause regurg back into left, left ventricle. You cause a whole lot of problems. So you can't, it's almost like if the balloon pump wasn't inflated, it's like a cork almost. If you, if, you had a, if you had it corked off, how hard would your heart have to, have to squeeze to push that blood past that cork? So that's why it inflates when it's diastole and deflates when it's in systole because we want your heart to push against a smaller pressure gradient and if you have it inflated during systole your heart will be pushing against a really really high pressure gradient aka a cork in, in this sense so when your heart is resting it's in diastole so the balloon pump is inflated so what's going on there is there's counter pulsation going on which then helps the blood to better perfuse the coronaries and the system it's almost like an like an extra you could say pump because your heart's a pump. So this is an intra aortic balloon pump. When it inflates, it's giving the heart and the system an extra pump, extra pressure to push the blood where it's supposed to go. And that's what really assists the blood flow to the heart. This is what really perfuses your, your coronaries. This is what increases, increases the myocardial oxygen supply and at the same time decreasing the myocardial oxygen demand. So if you imagine this, so this is sitting in your era, and this is inflated, and then this is deflated. So your heart is in the astole, your balloon pump is, is inflated. So your valve is closed. So what's happening here? So if you have a balloon in there, what is it causing? It's causing a, a higher pressure. And if you're causing a higher pressure, it displaces the blood and it pushes it further where it has to go. So when it's inflated, this is when you're using the counter, counter pulsation to push the blood into the coronary arteries and also push the blood further into the body. And then with systole, the blood pump is closed. So think about it. When you go from inflated to deflating, it's almost like you're making a, a sucking motion because you're going from inflate to deflating and that deflation, it almost, in a sense, pulls some of your blood from the left ventricle go through the aortic valve into the system ultimately leading to better cardiac output. So the heart is working less because it's getting an assistance from, from this change in pressure in the aorta. So technically, your heart has to not pump as hard, not squeeze as hard because this balloon pump is going from inflation to deflation. And it's helping move that blood from the body, from the heart to then the body. So the goal, the main goal of this inflation is to displace the blood into the coronaries. So we want to augment the diastolic pressure. So augment, we want to make it greater. So this balloon pump 
is making the DASA pressure technically greater for a little bit in the aorta so that it could better push that blood and perfuse the coronary arteries and then leading to a decrease in myocardial oxygen demand while increasing the myocardial supply and perfusion. So again, what this is doing is it's increasing the aortic pressures, it's increasing your MAP with the goal of providing more oxygen to the myocardium and also increasing the coronary perfusion. And then during deflation, once again, what is happening and the goal is for it to decrease the pressure in the aorta so that the ventricle can have an easier time to push against this, this lower pressure. So that way, if this pressure is less than what the heart expected to be because it was an heart failure, you had his balloon pump and deflates, lower the pressure, so now it's able to push blood harder and further with less strength because you're decreasing that pressure. Your heart doesn't have to push against that very stiff pressure gradient that it once had to push through before the intraaric balloon pump was placed. So this decreases the pressures, which then helps the ventricles push the blood through. This temporarily increases the pressure in the aorta to help better perfuse the coronaries, while deflation helps to decrease that pressure to help the heart push through the systemic vascular resistance and better perfuse the whole body. So with that being said, if you're going to have one major takeaway or if you're going to be asked, what does the intra-aortic bloom pump do? Just remember these three things. We call it 3.5 things because number three technically is two things in one. But if anybody ever asks you, a physician comes up to you, maybe you're uh, a new nurse, maybe you're starting in the cardiac ICU. If you remember these things, it's going to make this a little simpler or vice versa. You kind of have to know both. But if you at least understand what the intra aortic balloon pump does, you kind of figure out the, the rest of the of the equation and you could understand why we put bloom pumps in. So the main thing is that the intraaortic bloom pump does on a heart is increases cardiac output, increases myocardial oxygen demand, at the same time decreases afterload and decreases preload. So your heart is basically all pressures. If you can adjust one pressure, if you can lower one pressure, it's going to affect the heart in a, in a certain way. Like back to over here, when you increase the dose, the diastolic pressure, when you increase the pressure in the aorta, what happens? You get more provisions for coronaries. But we don't want that during systole. Because if you get that during systole, it means your heart has to work harder. So that's why we deflate the balloon because we want your heart to work to work less. So when your heart is resting, we want to push blood. And when the heart is active, we want to pull blood in a way, if that makes, that makes a little bit more sense. So back to this. If you got to remember something, if you have one takeaway from this, I want you guys to remember these things. What does the intraaortic balloon pump do? Increases cardiac output, increases in myocardial, myocardial oxygen supply, at the same time decreases afterload, decreases preload. It increases cardiac output because it helps the ventricles push past a lower pressure gradient with deflation of the balloon. It increases myocardial oxygen supply because we are inflating the balloon during diastole to help better perfuse the coronaries, and it decreases afterload and preload. Afterload is associated with systemic vascular resistance and also the pressure that the heart has to push past to be able to push blood into your system, which we help with deflation of the balloon. And preload, we associate that with like your CVP, we associate that with the pressure going into your right atrium and that is consequently, we don't directly affect it because we don't do anything in, in the in the right side sense. We only put this on the left side, but the fact that you are decreasing the afterload, decreasing the workload of the heart, you're then causing a decrease in preload because your heart doesn't have to work as hard. You're decreasing pressures at the end part of the cardiac cycle, therefore causing a decrease in pressure in the beginning site of the cardiac cycle, you could say. Something else to remember, I wish I had a balloon pump here, but balloon pump is basically this rectangle machine on wheels and it has its own monitor. A lot of times you will see this kind of a waveform. You will see your 
EKG under, you will see the amount of gas in there. You will see how it's inflating. You will see the augmentation. You will see all the pressures. I'll put it up, I'll pull it up on, on the screen so you guys could see. But you're going to see all this, and you're going to see some stuff that says unassisted, unass unassisted, assisted. And it's going to give you two different systolics, two different diastolics. It's going to give you your augmentation. It's going to give you your map. So something to always remember is that your unassisted systolic blood pressure is going to be ideally lower than your balloon augmentation. Another thing is your augmented diastolic pressure is going to be lower than the unassisted diastolic pressure. And also the assisted systolic pressure is going to be lower than the unassisted pressure. So your patient's intrinsic or unassisted pressures, they're going to be greater than the pressures that the balloon pump is is helping with so all your assisted pressures are going to be less than your patient's normal pressures because remember heart is is pressure if you have a high pressure the heart's working harder so the goal with the balloon pump is to decrease the pressures except for the one time when the balloon pump is inflated and it's helping perfuse the coronaries during that time we want to have a high pressure because to push that blood, but all the other pressures we're going to want want higher. All the working pressures, we could say all the working pressures of the heart and the systolic pressures, we want those to be lower. This is the you could say the relaxing pressure. We want those to be we want those super high as well because that's going to be an issue as well. But we want them to be a little bit higher to help better perfuse the heart and help the heart work a little bit better versus the working pressure systolics. We want those to be to be lower so the harder that's to work as hard as I have to push past those pressures as hard as I have to pump as hard. So some of the complications we could have because of this intra-aortic balloon pump, we could have a aortic dissection. The balloon could be could be uh, filling improperly, maybe filling too much. Um, it could also burst. It could basically cause a aortic dissection, which is super scary. Person might have some very very severe aortic stenosis or just a very very weak. Um, the aortic a tissue vessel around it. Limb ischemia. So this balloon can can move. Um, it can cause limb ischemia if it goes too low. It can drop your your renal perfusion. If it goes too high, it can affect your perfusion to your brain. So you have to watch out because remember this is a line and our patients do move around. So just be careful where this is. If you see a decrease in your output. That's a sign to maybe get worried that, hey, maybe the balloon pump migrated a little bit lower and it's impeding the renal vessels. Or if your patient starts to get some neurological issues, um, maybe they're not remembering where they are, just some kind of change in their neural status, it could show that the balloon pump maybe migrated too high and it's impeding that perfusion to the, to the brain. It could cause renal failure, uh, same reason it can cause neurological complications. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Usually, we have these patients oftentimes on a heparin drip, or oftentimes where this balloon is heparinized, so it doesn't clot off. It could cause that. And just the fact that your body has a foreign object in it, it increases the likelihood of thrombocytopenia. It's with any kind of foreign device that you put in the body that's going to stay there for a long time, especially if it affects the heart. Research shows that for whatever reason, I'm sure I could look, look it up for you guys. I'm sorry that I didn't. But every time you introduce a foreign device in your body, your body likes to attack it. And oftentimes it, it leads to a thrombocytopenia. It can cause infection. Remember, this is sitting in your aorta. And if you place this in an unsterile fashion, it can cause an issue. If the dressing is bad, it could cause a, an infection. So there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong. Lots of risk for infection here. The balloon could also rupture. It's got helium gas that I forgot to mention. So... This is going to get filled up with air. This gets filled up with helium gas because worst case scenario, if this were to rupture, helium, helium gas doesn't affect the the blood the same way that the air does. Because if this was, if this was air in here, your patient would throw a clot. There will be like a air embolism and they could die. But with it having helium, your body is able to absorb that helium and it won't affect it as much as it would affect air because this is air. That's why we would say, you know, make sure your, your lines don't have any air because you have an air embolism. 
imagine if this this had air and this ruptured that inst- instant that death right away pop and imagine that air keep getting pushed into that helium it metallizes differently so your body has a different way of of binding to it binding to it and getting rid of it so the one last thing i want to go over is is this little diagram here so this is your intra aortic bloom pump waveform so when you go look at this you're also going to see how it's paired up with your with your um, ekg ecg so this waveform this is the waveform your bloom pump produces on the monitor and this is a waveform that you should understand and it should look like this this one is a one to two so as we put our patient to a one to one which is with every cardiac cycle we are assisting them so as we put them to one to two where it's every other beat we're assisting them we also might do one to three which is every third beat we are assisting them depending on how sick they are usually patients start off at a one to one then we slowly move them to a one to two so what's happening here so the first you can say up wave is going to be your under this one's one to two so your first up wave here these two right here are going to be your unassisted systole so this is the patient's regular unassisted systole this is your patient's systolic regular blood pressure one on the bottom here this is your unassisted aortic and diastolic pressure so this is unassisted so this you could say this is your your unassisted heartbeat this is your your cardiac cycle of what's going on with your patient when it's he's just regular no balloon pump interference no balloon pump assistance this big one so now you have your balloon pump working this is your diastolic augmentation pressure so you know how we said it we augment things to make it greater so we're making the diastolic pressure greater see how it's above the other pressures because now the balloon pump is inflated and we are increasing bridge this pressure so then we can better perfuse the the coronary arteries and then it drops and this is your assisted aortic and diastolic pressure you know how i mentioned that we want the pressures to be lower see where the patient's unassisted diastolic pressure was right here now with the blue pump's assistance it looks a lot lower right so this is the bloom pumps assisted aortic and diastolic pressure and this is where we have a drop in in myocardial oxygen demand so we went from a high pressure remember we're filling this bloom pump we're pushing the, the blood just for a little bit just for a little bit because we want that blood to be pushed over there we want a high pressure to better perfuse coronaries then it drops here's this diastolic pressure and then top the bloom pump then deflates and this one is going to be also lower than the unassisted systolic pressure. Maybe I should draw a little bit lower, but to me when I was drawing this, it looked like it was lower. So so ultimately, your assisted systolic is going to be lower than your unassisted systolic pressure. Like I said, the pressures we want to, we want to make the pressures as low as we can to prevent added stress on the heart, make it pump more effectively, more efficiently. I want to dec- decrease the systolic and diastolic pressure except for one instance where we are augmenting diastolic pressure to then better perfuse the coronaries so that guys is my rundown of the intro aortic bloom pump it took me a long time to finally be able to understand this so hopefully i did a good job of explaining to you hopefully you gained some insight some knowledge about it but this is a really fascinating machine it's really cool once you fully understand it it's really really scary in the, the beginning but once you understand why we do it how it works, how the waveform looks. What are, what are we actually trying to do with this? It's a lot. It's a lot easier to understand. You actually feel like, okay, now I kind of understand when physicians ask me about this or they tell me this, or now I understand the plan of care because the balloon pump's supposed to do this, or even with troubleshooting. You know, what's going on with with the balloon pump? Why is it why is it alarming? Is there no waveform? Is it not inflated? Is that deflated? Is the timing off? Is it is it supposed to be set to one to one, but I had it set to one to two. So I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation on the intro aortic bloom pump. And I wish you guys best of luck. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out to me. Thank you so much. Oh, I gotta go. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my 